Hello, and thank you for joining the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program, which is brought to you through the support of our sponsors and our expert contributors. The PNA is dedicated to educating people with pituitary disorders, their families, and their healthcare providers. The PNA is a nonprofit organization that relies on the support from our members and donors. During the webinar, feel free to type in your questions at any time. Please note that all questions will be saved until the end of the webinar. We have a lot of time to answer as many questions as possible. Today's webinar, Optimizing Patient Quality of Life Following Pituitary Adenema Surgery, is presented by Dr. Raj Mukherjee and Dr. Nick Rowan. Please hold as there will be a brief delay while we change presenters. Looking good, guys. Screen slides up there. Yep, yep. Yes, perfect. Thank perfect. you. Thanks so much for the introduction, Danielle. Um, good evening, everybody. Welcome to um, Baltimore. I don't know when you're watching it. It's uh, February 15th right now, about 7 p.m. on the East Coast, and uh, about 30, uh, 32 degrees outside. Um, excited to talk to you tonight about uh, optimizing patient quality of life. Um, following pituitary surgery. My name is Nick Rowan. I'm an endoscopic skull base surgeon and rhinologist from uh, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Uh, pleasure to be here with uh, my wonderful partner, Dr. Raj Mukherjee. So let's go ahead and get started. And uh, first off, for disclosures, um, I don't have any, not for this talk. Uh, I care a lot about patients and like making them do better, and that's probably the most important thing. The objectives of this talk are, I know that we have a, a, a broad audience, um, but I'd like to go over tonight, first kind of quality of life and endoscopic uh, pituitary surgery, kind of talk about what we know, how we measure it, and how to design some quality of life um, uh, investigations. I'd li also like to ask, I think that, i uh, also like to ask why the slides are looking funny, um, but I'd like to know, uh, like to ask, is there anything we're missing in quality of life in endoscopic surgery? Is there, is there anything that perhaps we kind of overlook, like smell loss, taste loss? I'm certainly biased. I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon, so I care about how kind of the rest of the head and neck works um, and intimately kind of involved with taking care of patients with nasal disorders. I'd like to talk about approach-specific consideration. So if perhaps there's an adenoma that's in a particularly uh, unique spot, are there any challenges to that area that we might go that might present quality of life issues afterwards following management of these types of tumors. And then talk about some of the uh, thoughts that Dr. Uh, Mukherjee and I have had about where we're going. So how we can make improvements in post-operative quality of life and how we can even improve olfactory outcomes afterwards. I'd be remiss to mention that there wasn't a lovely webinar presented um, by Dr. Yoon and Dr. Little um, earlier th this past summer. And these guys are certainly um, they are uh, leaders in the field, and they are people that I uh, personally look up to. Uh, I, don't, I don't know them uh, personally. I've, I've read a ton of their papers, and these guys are quite simply stiller. And I thought it was a great talk um, about why do I feel, still feel lousy after the treatment of my pituitary tumor. It has the most views, I think, of all the Pituitary Network Association uh, webinars, and I would check it out. Um, it was really, really well done. And so first off, what do we know? Well, we know that using the endoscopic corridor, so going through somebody's nose, uh, certainly um, there's many advantages to it over the traditional approaches where um, uh, typically what we do is we use a speculum or a microscope. And we know that a team-based ear, nose, and throat surgery and neurosurgeon approach is associated with some potential really excellent outcomes, notably including visualization um, and in potentially improved surgical outcomes. However, I'd like to focus on tonight kind of what are some of the disadvantages? What are some of the negative outcomes of this type of surgery? What are, this, what are the, some of the things that we don't necessarily um, talk about in this, in, in this surgery? Even though there are many advantages, we do know that there are unique morbidities that are related to this type of surgery when using the nasal corridor, even in routine cases. So this is the sphenoid ostia right here. This is a tiny little hole about the size of a grain of rice leading into the sphenoid sinus, which at the back end of it houses the pituitary gland. 
Um, this is a picture of the cella, um, which is kind of where the pituitary gland lives, right in the center of the screen. And you can see that there was probably an ear nose, and th ear, nose and throat surgeon named Nick Rowan chomping away at some bone there. And pretty soon I've got my neurosurgical partner, Dr. Mukherjee, in there. And we have the pituitary gland and the carotid artery exposed right there. And so the proximity to critical neurovascular structures certainly makes these types of surgeries um, you know, something that certainly I respect from a surgical perspective, but there are potential implications of operating in this area. Um, a lot of way I think about skull-based surgery, not necessarily pituitary surgery, but the skull-based surgery that I do is it's minimally invasive. So we use this tiny little small hole. We don't leave an incision on your head, but it can be maximally destructive. It can really injure the inside of the nose, and that's something we need to be thoughtful about. So we know that pituitary tumors have obvious quality of life implications based on local compression, um, based on potential visual loss, based on hormonal abnormalities. Um, but what we overlook is that this is somebody's nose about a week and a half post-op, and this is what it can look like afterwards. And you bet that this patient is complaining of really the kind of the, the feeling of like the worst cold of their life. Um, and there's implications of using the sinonasal corridor. So patients get nasal blockage, they get nasal crusting, they have they could potentially have sinusitis. Certainly they can't smell. If you can't move any air through your, through your nose, you can't smell past this. Um, uh, quite simply, this is a giant booger. Patients come into the office, they're full of mucus, and we get, the goal afterwards is to make them heal and take, the, take that mucus out of there. Um, and so what we also know is that quality of life has actually become a measure of surgical success. So beyond the traditional outcomes of, did you get it all, doc? Did I survive the operation? Did I have a uh, CSF leak, how long am I stay in the hospital? These, this is really kind of where our field is going. These are the kind of metrics that we're increasingly focusing on. And it's important to remember that many of these pituitary pathologies, although they do cause significant um, uh, symptoms and they may be devastating to a patient from a, from a quality of life and a functional standpoint, they are still benign. And so um, this, the surgical goals need to take that into account. And I think that's, uh, you know, my partner and I share that philosophy very much so. So how do you assess quality of life? Well, it's important to remember that surgeons are incredibly biased and uh, we'd be lying if we told you otherwise. And it's implicit in what we do. Um, we um, think that, you know, um, uh, that what we know is, is what is best, but it's a shared decision-making process that needs to be done with the surgeon and the patient. And the patient needs to tell us how they feel, what the quality of life implications are. So patient-reported outcome measures, known as PROMs, they are uh, captured from patients, not surgeons. And so patients need to uh, answer uh, validated surveys to kind of tell us how they're doing. There's a wide number of quality life metrics that exist ranging from broad general health related quality life surveys to really disease specific, super nuanced uh, surveys. And certainly when we think about these types of surgeries, there's an example on the uh, right side of the screen there of an endoscope going through the nose kind of showing the approach to the, uh, to the skull base, um, that there are many potential implications. And I'm not gonna go over all the anatomy on here necessarily. Um, for, for, the, for the patients, uh, don't Google too much. For the physicians, you know where these spots are. Um, but as you go to the different regions of the skull base, you could potentially have issues with olfactory loss, potentially even olfactory impairment. Um, sometimes if tumors kind of go out to the side pretty far, out towards the middle crania fossa, there can be issues that we think about. Um, related to the eye, related to the, some of the nerves that control uh, sensation in the face. As we go further to the back of the, of the nose um, and the skull base and the posterior cranial fossa, there's some big blood vessels, namely the basilar artery there that you could have, um, you could potentially injure. And in certainly really big surgeries, not necessarily so much pituitary surgeries, but in very, very large surgeries, there's even the potential for some external deformities um, that can change the shape of the outside of the nose. So as I mentioned, there's many quality life assessments that are available. And so I'm a rhinologist. I'm a uh, ear, nose, and throat surgeon focusing almost exclusively on nasal conditions. And so the, uh, the kind of fun acronym that we have for our quality life instrument that tells you how to have sinonasal functioning, it's called the SNOT-22. It's something that we use very commonly. I, um, I assess in all of my um, patients who are getting sinus surgery or getting pituitary surgery. And this is, a pic, this is a depiction of how patients do with regard to their, um, their uh, SNOT-22 scores following surgery. So starting on the left-hand side of the screen, that's baseline, going out to 96 weeks post-operatively. We can see that pretty much everybody in the first month, they all do poorly. And again, remember, 
their noses look like this. So they have lots of quality of life disruptions. So the SNOT22 score starts to go up. However, afterwards and over time, there's significant improvements in these SNOT22 scores at three, six, and 12 months postoperatively. What's really interesting, um, well, first of all, again, it kind of goes from this picture to, I haven't shown Dr. Mukherjee this picture yet, but this is a patient I saw in clinic just the other day, and she had a, a giant flap in her nose, and we reconstruct her, and it looked beautiful. It's pink, it's healthy. She's got a nice sinus cavity in the back there. And um, so as, they, as you improve, your symptoms get better. We know that um, looking at the pa patients with the uh, depiction of the orange line there, patients who don't have sinus symptoms, they actually kind of return to baseline afterwards. What's really interesting is that patients who have sinonasal symptoms, they actually do better over time. Um, so if you have uh, some uh, nasal issues going into surgery, um, it's really important that we focus on making sure that there's appropriate healing. So the SNOT22, um, it, it's not, it, it's something that was only just recently, this past summer, it was validated in patients undergoing uh, endoscopic skull base surgery and uh, specifically pituitary surgery. However, this is a really interesting, uh, really interesting uh, study. And you can see the second author is Dr. Little, who again gave that wonderful presentation before. Dr. Little and his team showed us that about 50% of the questions in the SNOT22, they're not actually, they don't, patients don't have any problems with them. They're not responsible for any of the change. Um, and so this is a solid foundation um, to measure quality of life in patients afterwards with regard to their sinus complaints. However, it doesn't account for all the other issues. So just because you have a stuff you know, is that we haven't asked anything about how your, how's your vision? Are you having endocrine abnormalities? Are you having any problems inside your head? You know, that's what our biggest concern is. Um, or if patients are um, having some sort of additional therapy like radiation or additional medical therapy, we haven't asked any questions about that. So I think it's important to talk about what an ideal quality of life instrument uh, includes. And uh, certainly we need to consider the extent of the tumor resection. We need to think about potential surgical complications. We need to talk about visual, hormonal, and sinonasal outcomes. Sinonasal outcomes are not the only thing we should be looking at. Um, again, I am biased, but we should comprehensively look at patients. So several tools do exist. Um, and our group looked at all of the published literature that has all of the quality of life instruments. And really there's five big instruments that have been validated specifically in patients undergoing endoscopic skull-based surgery. Now, those five are listed here. And the two that we focus on in our practice are number one, the skull-based inventory, and number two, the ASK nasal 12. The skull-based inventory is a really nice instrument from a group uh, done in Colorado, that, uh, excuse me, in Toronto. That has, uh, that has published on this for several years, kind of comprehensively showing how patients do. The ASK Nasal 12, however, is a, is a, um, is a single, uh, is a single uh, uh, instrument that looks pretty much exclusively at sinus complaints, but it's really just the 12 questions that bother you most. So how do, do you breathe through your nose? Do you have congestion? Do you have crusting in your nose? Do you have drainage? Can you smell? Can you taste? And how much do you like your nose? And that's really important too. So I'm a big fan of kind of comprehensively evaluating patients with these two instruments. However, even though these instruments are great, I have consistently asked the question, is there anything we're missing? And so again, here's my bias and I'm very upfront about it, but the importance of olfaction cannot be overstated. If you can't smell, you can't smell health hazards, like uh, if something's on fire, you can't smell your own body odor, or if you put on too much perfume, you're not socially aware. It can be associated with uh, uh, depression and anxiety related issues. And it's got some pretty substantial implications, um, including issues with mortality, uh, reduced overall quality of life, even your cognitive function. If you can't smell, it, it can really uh, hinder you psychosocially. And I think this is really important and something that we focus on in our surgeries. Um, it's very likely that the degree of uh, olfactory or smell dysfunction that patients have afterwards usually correlates to the amount of tumor that's in the area. So in advance of surgery, if there's no tumor kind of in that area, we can generally use some uh, nuanced surgical techniques to avoid that area. And I'll show a slide of that, of that next. Um, however, um, it, it's still something that we need to take into consideration. Um, and most studies that have been published on this, they're actually not very well done. They kind of ask uh, just globally, hey, how does your sense of smell work? And um, you know, um, many patients are actually not super accurate at saying to a fine degree. It's like kind of like guessing your blood pressure. You might know if it's really high or if it's really low because you're having a bad headache or you're fainting at either end. However, um, assessing your sense of smell, patients generally are not super reliable at it. So there's really kind of objective ways that we should be measuring this. 
Um, there was a really nice uh, uh, systematic review with meta-analysis put out by the Mayo Clinic on this. They looked at patients who mostly had pituitary type surgeries, um, and they found that most patients did okay um, when you just operated in the region of the pituitary gland. Um, but there was a pretty high heterogeneity and substantial variation between all the studies. In many studies, they did just fine, but they used kind of poor measures of the sense of smell. In other studies, they um, uh, were a bit more detailed. And what we know, what we found out uh, over the years are that if on the right side of the screen, there's an arrow that pops up that says, save this. We know that that area, we know exactly where the smell nerve lives, and there's a special uh, smell sensing mucosa in the nose called the olfactory cleft, that um, if we preserve that, patients generally do pretty well afterwards. Um, and most patients uh, do not have issues with um, long-term uh, smell loss. Um, it's generally something that is transient in nature, so it's short-lived. So within the first uh, number of weeks, certainly the first number of months following surgery. Um, but how about other uh, sensory impacts? Um, and so if we look at this study um, put out by Cornell way back in 2013, almost a decade ago now, um, they actually found that in their patients that patients report distinctly that there's disruptions um, in their sense of taste. So why would this happen? We haven't operated in the tongue. Um, we haven't been in the mouth. Um, you know, that's kind of what my, my head and neck surgery colleagues do. But Dr. McCurgy and I, we kind of stay away from that area. You know, it's like lip, upper lip and up. And so um, we actually looked at this in all the patients that we had seen in our first few years in practice. And we actually found, um, you can see by the, uh, by the orange and the gray bars there, the patients actually distinctly report their smell and taste um, is, uh, is disrupted or different um, even after their sense of nasal blockage, their nasal drainage, and the rest of their sinus complaints improve. So this was really interesting, and we kind of asked, why this? Well, as it turns out, about 90% of what we perceive as, I'm air quoting right here, I don't know how the video is coming up, but I'm air quoting just so everybody gets a good visual, um, that 90% of what we say is, Taste is actually this thing called flavor, and 90% of that actually comes from our nose. So while we're chewing our food, we actually sense, we smell the food as we're, as we're chewing it. And so a lot of what we perceive as taste is actually flavor. Um, and so that's my working hypothesis as to why patients have taste uh, problems afterwards. But really, there's uh, incredibly poor data. The science is not there yet there to back it up. We don't have any studies where they've done kind of objective testing on patient's sense of taste. And so this is something that um, Dr. Mukherjee and I actually are interested in and may or may not be piloting in the near future with some coming programs. So um, keep your eyes peeled for that. Maybe the Pituitary Network Association will have us back in a couple of years and we can report our findings. And so going back to um, the slide that I showed before about all of these different areas that we operate in, um, are there ways that we can help prevent uh, uh, some issues with each of these things? So smell loss, numbness, uh, potential of visual related issues, uh, nasal deformity problems, or even neurovascular injury. And my suggestion is that yes. And I think that we as a field, we should be focusing on these quality of life outcomes and making our surgery technically better or helping, helping patients heal better in the post-operative course. So some interesting questions that we have are, um, you know, are there ways that we can pre better protect the nose when we're operating in the nose? Can we be a little more delicate so we don't any, cause any scarring, additional bleeding, additional need for healing afterwards? Can we make the nose look just like it did when, we, when, uh, when we're finished, at, when we started? And so this is a potential protective device that we might want to use in the nose to protect the endonasal corridor. Um, we also want to know, is there a way that we can actually help healing? So this is a nice study um, put out between um, the University of Alabama, uh, where Dr. Woodworth is, and Dr. Nyack at Stanford, um, and a whole slew of their colleagues who helped them get this study done. And they actually took a graft, and they put a graft in the nose on uh, the exposed area where the nasal septal flap is taken from, which is oftentimes one of the, the, one of the last places to heal. And uh, what they showed was that, um, what, what they showed is that uh, if you put a graft down, uh, patients can actually heal faster. Um, this was a basic science study, mostly basic science study, so it wasn't really looking at quality of life outcomes, but I bet, and my hypothesis is that if the nose is healing better, patients are complaining less, their quality of life is improved, and so something we should be uh, shooting for. Uh, finally here, um, there's a very interesting study that also came uh, from uh, some authors at uh, Stanford and mostly from, uh, from Emory, 
and they looked at uh, decreasing rates of post-operative smell loss. And what they did was very simple. They put everybody on saline rinses afterwards, which is the mainstay of healing afterwards in my practice, um, is having patients wash their nose to remove the crusting and the drainage and the mucus that builds up. And in, in addition to that, what they did is they treated patients with a, uh, with a uh, omega-3 supplement. And what they found uh, is that um, by six months post-operatively, the patients who received the omega-3 supplement actually did better. I think that this study certainly needs to be, um, needs to be replicated um, and probably have some pretty rigorous smell testing involved. However, this is a really enticing study that shows that perhaps patients um, can heal a little bit better afterwards by using something that's pretty low risk like omega-3 supplementations. So in summary, um, quality of life in endoscopic skull-based surgery, specifically pituitary surgery, it's super important. It's actually a way that we measure our success. Um, many of these pituitary pathologies, they've been managed very well for decades and patients do, can do very well afterwards, even though it can be a challenging disease. Um, and so it's something that helps us to aid in our surgical, surgical decision-making process. It's something that we talk about with our patients up front um, before surgery and throughout their recovery uh, post-operatively. We know that there's many different ways to measure quality of life. There's probably no perfect instrument. Um, however, I think it's important to be kind of be global and uh, think about patients as a whole, not just as in one particular thing. Um, and uh, we certainly need to kind of speak the same language as surgeons, um, endocrinologists, and everybody who kind of works together, neuro-ophthalmologists in treating these patients and kind of use the same language. And so we need to kind of use the same, uh, sa the same quality of life questionnaires. And that's something I feel really strongly about. Um, finally, uh, with regard to the stuff that I deal with mostly, these sinonasal quality of life disruptions. So again, there's a high level of variability across the data. However, it's generally pretty transient. Um, we know that patients who have bigger surgeries, they're at bigger risk for having issues afterwards. Um, and so I think it's important to many of those studies that I flashed uh, up on the screen, they have multiple institutions that are involved. And I think it's important that we as a field continue to study um, quality life outcomes from multi-institutional uh, and multi-investigator perspective to make sure that we're getting a representative picture of all the patients that we're treating uh, across the country and quite frankly, across the world. Um, and we should be really thoughtful about some of these nuanced uh, um, issues that patients may or may not have afterwards and how to minimize complications and thereby make the best outcome. Um, and so with that, I uh, happily turn the floor over, uh, rather the screen over, to my good friend and colleague, and Raj, take it away. Danielle, if you don't mind changing the screen. Great, great. Thanks, Nick. No uh, while we're waiting for the, uh, the slides to uh, change over, let's see here. Um, let's see. Are you guys able to see my slides here? Any chance, hopefully full screen. I, we can't see them at all. Really? Okay. Exactly. Uh, let's uh, try that again here. Uh, can you can you ask to uh, can you ask for that share yeah. screen? Again? We're we're seeing we're seeing you now, Raj. Can you uh, can can you put it in presenter mode? Oh sure, yeah, yeah. Yep. yep. You see it now? Or not so much? Nope. Uh, I'm seeing a white screen. Uh, okay. <laughs> let's see here. How about uh, just to, to make sure we move along. How about I uh, uh, make it bigger like this somehow and see how that goes. How's that? I know that's... Uh, nope. Uh, we, should take, we should take the moment to troubleshoot Let me go ahead and just yeah. um, resend it. Hold on one second. Okay. Okay. We've got lots of really good jokes, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. You get ready for the first ear, nose, and throat surgery joke? How do you make a tissue dance? <laughs> Dr. Mukherjee, you, uh, I think you put a boogie in it. Is that right? Put a little boogie in it. <laughs> there we go. Uh, let's see. Main screen. Hmm. Sorry, everybody. We tried this beforehand. Uh, main screen, show screen. All right. I see your see. full screen now. Yep. There we go. Okay. Let me see. Just put it in slideshow. We should be ready to rock and roll. We're good. Yep. Perfect. Great. 
right. I'm not a, I, I am a brain surgeon, but I'm not a, uh, you know, an IT tech whiz. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, no thanks problem. for your patience. Da Danielle, uh, uh, we really want to thank you. I want to really thank you again, as well as the Pituitary Network Association. I think for, for many, many years, uh, the PNA has helped uh, numerous patients, countless patients across the country and across the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, Nick and I are really honored to, to join a long list of some of the, the biggest names in, in pituitary and skull-based surgery that have uh, presented at this forum, uh, you know, over the past uh, several months and over the past many years. So it's, it's truly an honor uh, and it's wonderful to be, uh, especially here as a resource uh, for, for some of the patients. Uh, uh, they're going to be watching this live uh, as well as watching it, you know, on YouTube later. Um, I, think, I think Nick did a, a great job as always. Um, in terms of framing things. And I, I, I really just have two objectives in terms of adding on to, to some of the things that he mentioned. Um, first, I wanted to mention just a brief history of how we got to where we are with endoscopic and nasal surgery. Um, you know, patients that have had uh, pituitary lesions and, and, and skull-based lesions go back to antiquity. Uh, and I think there are some interesting lessons over time uh, that have been learned. Um, and particularly uh, as we moved into the, 20, uh, in the, into the 21st century, uh, the move towards uh, minimally invasive approaches as well as collaborative approaches, uh, you know, using uh, wisdom uh, and, and expertise from, from multiple fields, including uh, ENT, neurosurgery, radiation oncology, endocrinology, and the like, uh, has really transformed the field and, 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 and I think uh, drastically improved uh, patients' lives and outcomes. I think part and parcel with that, uh, you know, we've, we've had a transition uh, from, uh, from an academic perspective from just describing outcomes, things that uh, Nick mentioned earlier of just, you know, extent of resection and survival, uh, to really trying to predict quality. Uh, and I wanted to present some, some very tumor specific, some very uh, pituitary specific uh, outcomes uh, and quality measures. Uh, there's a, a huge, there's just a plethora of, of quality of life um, instruments. Uh, and I wanted to give you a sense of of how patients with different pituitary adenomas, specifically non-functional pituitary adenomas, prolactinomas, uh, Cushing's disease, and acromegaly, uh, differ because they they have vastly different uh, quality of life uh, outcomes. Uh, and then I also wanted to give uh, you a sense of, of what our preliminary data is from the QOD or the Quality Outcomes Database uh, Tumor Registry. Uh, it's a it's a registry that that um, that our institution is a part of. Uh, and that we're playing a lead role in, in gathering data on and hopefully doing a better job of predicting quality uh, uh, for patients. And, and want to make sure to uh, leave uh, uh, plenty of time for, for questions as well. So, um, so with that being said, um, you know, patients that have pituitary lesions and skull-based lesions genuinely date back to antiquity. So there's the Steinham skull uh, from the pre-Neanderthal period where someone, there was a patient, it wasn't a pituitary adenoma, but it was a skull-based tumor that really just modeled the entire left side of the head here. And so we have, um, you know, we have archaeological data that shows that people have been suffering from these lesions, you know, for as far back as humans have, ex have existed. Um, and when you look back yeah, even to ancient Egyptian times, this endonasal corridor is nothing new. It's, it, was, it was used for mummification. So they did at that time things that we would be horrified to now, which is going through the nose to suck out, uh, you know, the brain for mummification. Uh, by just going a little bit lower and being a, a bit more thoughtful, uh, we're able to get into this uh, pituitary area uh, and help patients uh, in, in, in really unique and, and novel ways. Uh, when it comes to the modern history of pituitary adenoma surgery, there are a few giants in the field. And one of them was Victor Horsley, who was really the father of European neurosurgery. And his, his school of thought um, in the early 1900s was to do this kind of, a, a, of an approach of a craniotomy. So this is a patient's head, top of the head here, this is the nose and the ear. So he would do a bicoronal incision from ear to ear, flap everything forward, retract the brain so that he could see the optic nerves and the pituitary uh, deep therein. And then he would put this all back. It was a, you know, it was standard, uh, standard of care and, and, um, and, and quite innovative at the time. But, you know, you can imagine for, for a pituitary adenoma to go through this kind of an approach is, uh, you know, there's uh, brain retraction, as you can see uh, on the brain here. There's manipulation around the optic nerves and and uh, I think thankfully we don't do this approach anymore but this is this is where things began all not not all that long ago um, uh, in a parallel fashion um, dr. Hirsch who is an otolaryngologist uh, in Austria as well as Harvey Cushing who is the father of American neurosurgery and actually you know started his practice here at Johns Hopkins where, where Nick and I have a chance to uh, to operate I uh, took more minimally invasive approaches and that was through the nose with dr. Hirsch uh, and through the upper gums with Dr. Cushing. Um, and, and it really was the first um, 
uh, set of thoughts that there could be, you know, as opposed to this, this really giant approach, um, a more tailored approach to a very specific area with a unique set of anatomy and, and, and problems. Um, uh, Nick and I and, and our colleagues, including uh, Adam Califalo, who's a wonderful neurosurgery resident at, at University of Miami, uh, last year published a series where we, we looked at actually the, uh, the, these trends in, in, in practice pattern amongst very experienced neurosurgeons uh, and skull-based surgeons with over 20 years of practice uh, who are quite busy, who produce uh, or, or um, uh, participate and lead uh, at least uh, one uh, endoscopic and a nasal approach uh, for, uh, for pituitary adenoma surgery per year. Uh, it was a very academically biased cohort, but we wanted to get a sense of even in the short term, even over 10 years, uh, what were the changes in practice patterns over time? Were people becoming more siloed? Were they uh, working together more? Were they doing big approaches or minimally invasive approaches? And really what we found was um, throughout the entire cohort, um, there was a significant increase in the, uh, in the amount of providers that, um, that did not in, uh, operate independently anymore, that were you know, operated in teams, oftentimes otolaryngologists and neurosurgeons. There was a huge increase. Essentially, everybody, almost everybody uses an endoscope now, um, you know, doing these approaches uh, that Nick just described. Um, and, uh, and rather than using this, this you know, uh, uh, sublabial corridor, which is through the upper gums, almost everyone uh, uses the, the, the endonasal corridor. It's been, it's been just such a workhorse uh, to be able to get directly where we need to be, uh, trying to minimize mor morbidity and, and maximizing extent of resection and through, um, through some uh, particular efforts trying to improve our quality of life. You know, historically, um, when we've looked at our outcomes, we've looked at broad outcomes like complications and death. But when we're talking about patients with pituitary adenoma surgery, this is, you know, it, it has a lot more to do than just mortality. As you can see in this very elderly um, uh, cohort of patients that we looked at at Hopkins many, many years ago, the, the mortality rate is exceedingly low. And this is a national data set. Uh, and the mortality rate was about 3%, even in the very elderly, including patients over 80. Um, but the complication rate, all comers, including fluid and electrolyte disorders, CSF leaks, et cetera, uh, was up to 30%. So, um, you know, these are dramatic numbers. Uh, it, it, it points to the importance of, of choosing patients carefully. Um, but it, it really doesn't give us a lot of predictive value in terms of how to um, tailor uh, discussions about complications and outcomes, uh, as well as quality uh, with patients. And so um, our group more recently has tried to look at ways of predicting at least first some of those traditional outcomes uh, and, then, um, uh, and then quality of life uh, in these patients. And so our, our multidisciplinary skull-based group, including uh, our wonderful endocrinologists, uh, uh, senior um, uh, endocrin uh, 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 otolaryngologists and neurosurgeons, um, looked at the, what they call the modified frailty index. And so historically, when people look at um, predictors of complications, you look at, you know, all the different um, medical issues that a person may have. And this is called the CCI, the, the Charleston Comorbidity Index, where you look at all of these different um, medical issues, uh, cardiovascular disease, dementia, COPD, diabetes, AIDS. Uh, but, you know, practically speaking, it's, it's really difficult to actually meaningfully incorporate this into, into, into daily practice. And so um, folks have first uh, modified this to, to a, a smaller scale called the Modified Frailty Index 11, and we actually looked to see whether something even more tailored, the Modified Frailty Index 5, looking at functional status, which is how independent a person is, as well as if they have a history of diabetes, COPD, CHF, or hypertension, uh, can really predict uh, some of the, um, the outcomes of interest, including length of stay, total hospital charges, readmissions, uh, and the like. Uh, and so what we found was, um, first of all, that uh, when you look at functional adenoma patients, there is a, a, a spread in terms of the comorbidities that, that these patients have. And as expected, Cushing's patients um, have a significantly higher number of baseline comorbidities and a worse uh, modified uh, frailty index score uh, than those, for instance, with prolactinomas, which you know the vast majority of those patients have, have no uh, comorbidities. We also found that an MFI-5 score of two or greater in patients with functional adenomas was associated with significantly worse outcomes, including um, some of those things that I mentioned, you know, readmissions, um, CSF leaks, uh, uh, diabetes insipidus and the like. So this gives us a, 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 a real um, an, an easy to calculate predictive marker of some of those traditional outcomes. 
Um, and while traditional outcomes may point us towards what a patient's quality of life may be, it's not as specific as asking that patient. Um, and so um, over time, especially over the last uh, couple decades, there's been an increasing uh, interest as we've moved towards more minimally invasive but potentially uh, maximally destructive approaches, uh, like the endoscopic and the nasal approach, there's been an increased uh, interest in looking at uh, patient-centered quality of life. And you can see here, um, you know, that, that dramatic rise um, over those, uh, you know, over about 20 years, and you, that, that, that trend has just continued uh, to rise in the last uh, several years or so. You know, when, when you look at the different types of ways that you can look at quality of life, this is a somewhat fuzzy because it's so uh, big uh, table uh, from a recently published uh, review article by, um, by the Lighting Group in, in, um, in the Netherlands that looks at all of the different quality of life instruments that have, looked, that have been assessed in patients with, uh, with pituitary adenomas. And as, as Nick referred to, there are some general quality of life instruments uh, that are used regularly. Um, one would be the short form uh, 20, otherwise the short form six, they're, they give you, um, you know, a general assessment of how a patient's health is doing. There's some disease-specific markers, and for folks with pituitary adenomas, you may be familiar with the acral qual and the cushing qual, uh, which are quality of life questionnaires uh, that um, that have been validated, particularly in this in these patient subsets. And then you have a set of do domain-specific questionnaires that have to do with, for instance, depression, sexual function cognitive function, um, things that can be a little bit more specific uh, um, uh, to particular symptoms, but may, may cross uh, different disease types. But you know, when you're thinking about looking at quality of life and you're left with this giant list of, of quality of life metrics, you know, it, it just isn't practical to, to give patients um, you know, dozens and dozens of questionnaires and just have them you know, sit for half an hour during an appointment to go through these things. So um, you know, I think the, uh, a, a big push of our research protocol um, as well as the field in general, is to, is to be as specific as possible um, while still being comprehensive, as, as Nick alluded to earlier. I think when we, when we think about different types of pituitary adenoma patients, we broadly think of them in, in large categories, including non-functional pituitary adenoma patients, prolactinoma, pro prolactinomas, patients with acromegaly, and patients with Cushing's. And, you know, each of these disease types may overlap in some, some form or fashion, um, you know, oftentimes there's a female predominance for non-functional pituitary adenomas and Cushing's disease. Um, there are often depressive symptoms in prolactinoma patients and patients with acromegaly, but some things are very, very specific. And so, um, you know, the, the, um, the short duration uh, of, of remission, specifically in Cushing's disease patients, uh, can often lead to a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, patients with acromegaly can particularly have issues with, with joint pain and musculoskeletal issues. Uh, patients with prolactinomas can have anxiety due to uh, often discharge from the chest, and, and, and especially in non-functional pituitary adenoma patients, they can have a lot of issues with visual function. So trying to find a comprehensive assessment for each of these um, uh, subtypes of, of pituitary adenomas is, is, is challenging to say the least. Um, one way of, I think, visualizing in terms of broad, broad terms um, how uh, different pituitary adenomas impact patients in terms of their quality of life actually comes from the lighting group. And so the next set of slides include what we call um, spider graphs. Uh, and so this includes eight different uh, domains, uh, general quality of life domains. And the collection of quality of life instruments and items that we referred to before are basically tabulated uh, and, and fall into each of these categories. So uh, physical functioning and physical role, pain, general health, vitality, and, and the like. Um, and so when you look at these instruments, the important point to know is that even a person who is completely healthy, um, you know, oftentimes is not at, it's not the norm to be at 100%. Uh, my son is 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 about uh, six months old, and he, he is about the only person I know that it is at about 100%, but even he has, you know, his moments. So uh, as adults, uh, oftentimes a normal range will be uh, in this area of about 80% or so. So you can see this, this uh, grayed out line uh, is basically for a, a regular healthy population. Now, when you look at people or look at patients, uh, non-functional pituitary adenoma patients before treatment, you can see uh, that, that the smaller um, uh, area is associated with worse overall quality of life. And you can see a dramatic improvement in these patients. Again, oftentimes that have headaches or, 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 or visual symptoms. You see a dramatic improvement from their pre-treatment quality of life state 
to their post-operative quality of life state, which pretty closely approximates uh, patients that, that never had pituitary adenomas at all. And ideally, this is what we would want the, the spider graphs to look for all pituitary adenoma patients. But, but as you'll see, uh, you know, for different, for different tumor types, um, uh, the expectations are, are a little bit different. So for prolactinoma patients, again, these are uh, often younger patients uh, that can have some, some anxiety and can have some issues with, with, um, uh, with fatigue and with, with chest discharge. They, um, you know, they do have pretty poor quality of life, you know, in the 50th percentile or less. They have pretty dramatic improvement um, with treatment, and oftentimes that's with medical management, including with cabergolin, and sometimes a debulking surgery if necessary. But but after treatment, whether it's medical or surgical, you can see from this group they they, they pretty closely approximate, uh, but maybe don't exactly uh, catch up to uh, the general population. Um, when we look at the, the the next two, though, you'll see um, particularly um, uh, as we move from acromegaly to Cushing's disease that. That even after treatment, patients, um, you know, don't quite uh, make it uh, back to the, you know, average um, uh, quality of life scores for the general population, as you can see here. And then with Cushing's disease, you know, they, they do have some improvement, you know, crossing that, that um, getting close to crossing that 50th percentile for quality of life, but still vastly uh, below, um, uh, you know, the general population in terms of the quality of life score. So I think, I think looking at some of these spider graphs does put into context, hopefully, uh, the significance of, of assessing quality of life and tracking these really important uh, uh, tumor-specific and patient-specific metrics uh, over time. Um, you know, in terms of our role and, and something that I, I alluded to earlier, um, I think we are uh, really fortunate to play a leadership role uh, in what they call the QOD tumor, the Quality Outcomes Database uh, Tumor Registry. So it's a, it's a prospective registry, um, uh, including personnel from, from Johns Hopkins, Mayo Clinic, a lot of other sites across the country. Um, so we include about 30 different sites currently across the country with, um, uh, where we're prospectively looking at quality of life in patients with a number of different tumor types. But uh, you know, my personal focus is on patients with pituitary adenomas. And so uh, using specific codes uh, for, for different procedures that we perform on these patients, including most often that uh, neuroendoscopy, which is a through the nose procedure, we're able to identify patients uh, that have thus far been a non-functional pituitary adenoma patients. And so we've gotten a lot of very specific data from this uh, very small and, 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 uh, and, and, and pilot registry. And so it includes a, a baseline a three months post-op and one year post-op uh, general and uh, some disease specific quality of life instruments. Uh, and, and things that in, in querying patients, um, we wanted to make sure that we answered, including ability to return back to work and, and um, fatigue and, and, and other questions of, of, of the like. Um, interestingly, again, it is a pilot study over the course of about a year. We've had a little bit over 100 patients enrolled. Um, there is a, a, a racial diversity, um, more so, honestly, than when we look at uh, uh, some other national data sets. Uh, and the majority of patients um, that have been enrolled, and I think will continue to be enrolled given our catchment area, um, has, um, you know, uh, does not have a, a college degree. Um, and again, this I mentioned this because um, it's somewhat different than, uh, than when you look at uh, other national retrospective data sets. So we're capturing a unique group of patients uh, that is more diverse than the data that's currently out there. Um, when you look at these patients, it, it does give us some data in terms of benchmarks and some of those traditional outcomes that I referred to earlier. So traditionally, we used to tell pituitary adenoma patients, you know, you'll go home and, and essentially no complications, no, no issues, no worries. Um, and by and large, this, this does fit the data, but it, uh, you know, this does tell us that you know, uh, about 10% of patients will not go home directly after surgery, and it's a good data point to know so that we can be honest and upfront with our patients. Um, the complication profile, especially in this non-elderly population, is, is, is quite low, which is wonderful, which is great. Um, uh, the CSF leak rate uh, is about 1%, uh, less than um, you know, historical controls from, from 20 to 30 years ago. And another important data point, though, is that about 5% of patients would need some kind of reoperation within within 30 days, uh, which is I'm sorry, within uh, 90 days, uh, which is you know not the usual um, bit that you would think, especially for a small pituitary adenoma patients. And so um, it's an important data point to make sure that we're honest and upfront. Um, beyond those uh, complication profiles, though, what I'm what I'm excited about is this preliminary data that gives us some. 
uh, ability to, uh, to provide patients with quality of life prognostic markers. And so specifically, what we're able to tell patients uh, if they have a non-functional pituitary adenoma and they're having anxiety is that by three months, we're expecting those patients to have a significant drop in anxiety to the point of being normal. Similarly, um, uh, similarly with depression and similar with sleep, uh, with, um, sleep disturbance and pain interference. The, the only issue, um, and this was not statistically significant, but the only issue that, that, that uh, in terms of these um, uh, quality of life uh, domains that still really bothered patients after surgery, even at, at three months, was fatigue. Um, and, uh, and so that's a point of, um, uh, you know, further investigation, especially with our endocrinology colleagues, is some of this may be due to, you know, managing uh, cortisol levels and, and, and the like. Um, and so, so with all that, uh, you know, we know that historically we can take someone with a Cushing's disease, uh, you know, this is someone that uh, Nick and I operated on a while back, uh, and give them a great resection with a, with a good, um, uh, you know, with a good uh, hormonal cure. Um, but getting them, you know, to this to this more um, uh, expected uh, uh, general uh, quality of life that's in in line with the general population is still is still a, a mountain that we need to climb. We can make the pictures look great, but making people look better and feel better on the inside is something else. And I think uh, a lot of the um, uh, the trials that, that 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 Nick referred to, a lot of these registries that I uh, referred to, and efforts that I referred to 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 try and analyze in a in a thoughtful way which patients are, are most prone to have good outcomes versus not so good outcomes, and how to move that bar uh, in the latter category uh, is really going to be it, it, it continues to be our effort now, and will continue to be uh, in the years to come. And, and working with uh, the PNA has been. Um, has been wonderful to sort of share this message and hopefully uh, to continue to build a network uh, where uh, we can share ideas and, and advance the field forward. Um, uh, on behalf of me and Nick, I, I wanted to thank uh, all of our colleagues here. Uh, here on the left is our Department of Neurosurgery at, at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, this is the, the Sinus Center uh, members uh, within the Department of Otolaryngology at, at Hopkins. We obviously always uh, work with our endocrinology colleagues down here with our Wilmer Eye Institute, especially for our non-functional adenoma patients and, and the radiation oncology team. Uh, and then three folks that are not pictured here, but who are a core part of our team and we couldn't do anything uh, without them are Chrissy Mahler, um, who is the medical office assistant that works with me, uh, Denise Williams, who's the uh, MOC that works with Nick, and, and Ashley Kang, who is uh, the physician assistant that works with me, but you know, functionally uh, is is uh, is kind of a Nick's uh, physician assistant as well. There, you can ask for a better team, uh, and we just wanted to thank them. Um, so thank you all for your time and for your attention. Uh, we'd we'd uh, be happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was such an informative presentation. We really appreciate you both for doing it. Um, I will give a couple minutes here for questions. We haven't received any yet. Um, we do have a comment that I will go ahead and read. It might be a comment with a question. In okay. 2003, I had a transphenoidal hyp hypovasectomy for a non-functioning tumor that had hemorrhage. It was a disaster and was not fully removed or refused radiation and pursued endoscopic surgery. Endoscopic surgery was performed six months later, and although it was discovered that the previous surgeon had put bone cement over the skull base entrance hole, it was removed successfully and the surgery completed in spite of the difficulty it had presented. I was tumor free until 2010 when the tumor returned. I had skipped my 2009 MRI, which would have detected it earlier. It had aggressively advanced far into my cavernous sinus. My previous endoscopic surgeon was able to remove the tumor, tumor and to date I have been tumor free. I take a weekly dose of cabergolin. I slowly lost my sense of smell over the years. Some scent comes through. My pituitary still is functioning normally and my life overall is good at 70 years old. Just hoping the tumor doesn't come back and as far as smell loss, at least I can taste. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, oftentimes people, well, first, thanks for sharing your story. I think, uh, you know, we all have a story in this life and uh, uh, we all go through our own journeys. And uh, despite all the things that happened in the past, it sounds like you're doing better, which is the most important thing, you know. I think, um, uh, you know, we've made some advances over time too. So um, I'm hoping it doesn't come back either. But I think, uh, 
um, you know, as long as you keep monitoring that, uh, hopefully if there is anything that, that pops through, hopefully, uh, you know, things treated earlier can often be treated easier than, than things treated later. Nick, and any thoughts on uh, smell, return of smell kind of stuff? Thanks for sharing, number one. Um, number two, the, the sense of smell, one of the things that I didn't say is that harder than taking out any tumor than what Dr. Mukherjee and I like have to worry about, whether it's a pituitary tumor or a cancer, it's something that's really tough to treat. We know that it's really, um, uh, we know that it's really important to health and vitality. Um, we know that it does impact our sense of flavor, but there's some really excellent resources out there. Um, there's a website, um, uh, there's a, uh, an organization called Absent. Uh, it's a play on words and it's, uh, it's uh, the word scent, uh, like scent of a candle with an A in front of it, uh, AB in front of it. They have some wonderful resources about loss of scent of smell, how you can potentially improve it, the literature that's out there. And I'd strongly encourage anybody that's listening in or watching this in the future, if you have smell or taste problems, to check that out. Um, you know, or certainly consider seeing an otolaryngologist. You know, some of us have special expertise in managing it. But thanks for sharing. Okay, thank you. And then another question just rolled in. How do the doctors propose that pituitary centers collaborate on outcomes? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think, um, you know, uh, traditionally that has not been done. Traditionally, each center would just produce their own data points and that was kind of it. I think um, I think there are two two or three efforts, multi-institutional efforts that come to mind. One is the QOD tumor registry, which is something I mentioned, uh, which honestly is housed within neurosurgery, within our you know uh, our neurosurgery uh, professional organization. Um, but I think it's a great resource. Uh, it's just very neurosurgery specific. Something that is more multidisciplinary uh, in nature is the North American Skull Base uh, Society's registry, basically. And so it's come. It, there's a certain committee that that works through them but but it is uh, inherently a multidisciplinary group that includes otolaryngologists neurosurgeons radiation doctors etc it's something that Hopkins is a part of um, and uh, I know we're we just put together a uh, um, you know, some collaborative data looking at the use of antibiotics, perioperative antibiotics uh, for pituitary adenoma patients. And I think that was just the start. So I think there's going to be more and more of that coming. And the third bit is what they call uh, is a, a multidisciplinary sort of unofficial group called the, the, the skull based think tank. Uh, and that includes a lot of folks that have trained together or that at least, you know, think about these issues together. So uh, Nick and I both uh, trained Nick for a long time as a resident and me for about a year, you know, as a fellow uh, at UPMC, but um, at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And so uh, between UPMC, Hopkins, uh, MD Anderson, and a handful of other centers, uh, we're working on really thoughtfully looking at our outcomes and our, our quality of life. Uh, so, um, so I think more on the horizon, but it's definitely a, a new phase uh, that we're entering right now. Yeah. Sorry, that was a bit long-winded, but that's how I am. <laughs> Sorry, Nick, you were going to say something? I said completely agree. Okay, thank you. We just got another question. After three pituitary adenoma surgeries and a surgery for CSF leak and sphenoid macocalae, I have yet to recover, still leaking and have another macocalae. Empty cella, my nose and cella are damaged. Is there a possibility of reconstruction? It sounds, as the, as the guy whose specialty is, you know, is trying to figure out how to fix holes, um, you know, that is, that's kind of the thing that uh, Raj and the neurosurgeons sometimes rely on me for is to figure out ways to, to, to fix things. That it can be a really challenging, really challenging problem. You know, um, I, uh, you know, generally my, my advice is, is it's, hard to, it's hard to know the situation that you're in. Um, it, it certainly sounds tough, but I'm a big proponent of saying that, you know, sometimes these, 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 um, these issues are certainly very complex and there's a lot of utility in continuing to work with your, your surgeon who you have been working with, you know, who has your best interest at heart and um, who is, um, you know, who's trying to help you. Um, and sometimes the, um, sometimes the pathology is kind of tough to overcome. I tell many of my patients that I don't use the words never or ever because We've learned, even though we're still younger folks uh, practicing medicine, and we hope we have a very long career ahead of us, I think, um, speaking for the two of us, we've both learned right away that, you know, never or ever, those things happen. 
Um, and that, that's part of the unfortunate risk of um, dealing with pathology in this area. Even something that is pretty routine and benign can have serious complications. And so um, I, 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 wish, I wish you the best. Um, CSF leaks are no fun to deal with. We've all dealt with them as something that kind of comes with the territory. And um, um, wish, wish you the best. And I, I think one one additional bit. I, I totally agree that you know that the you know the team that that worked with you, um, you know, knows your specific anatomy best. I you know presumably you know people don't go into medicine uh, unless they want to do good things for people, unless they want to be helpful, you know, bring meaning and and, and do good things. Um, sometimes, and so I, I I similarly would encourage you to. Uh, uh, you know, to connect to those providers. But I think, you know, um, sometimes when you feel like you're getting to the end of a, of a road and you don't feel like you can go further, I don't think there's any harm in, in, uh, in you know, getting a second opinion. Uh, and so if that's something you're interested in, whether it's us or with someone else, uh, I don't think there's any harm in, in reaching out. And if you did want to reach out to us, uh, to be honest with you, it's a little difficult to 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 just ring us up. I don't exactly. I mean, God knows where where those phone calls go. But but if you look up me, for instance, on my Hopkins webpage, it has my email address. Don't don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question. Also, a compliment. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Acromeg acromegaly patient had a transphobial pituitary surgery in two thousand eight. I was surprised to see numbness of the fingers as a common symptom. Have had that and hadn't thought of is it acro related. So I'll chat with my doc about that. Separately, any thoughts about how quality of life evolves in the years after one year after pituitary surgery? Are you leaving that one for me, Raj? Yeah, <laughs> why don't you give a first shot and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll chime in. So, so some of the data that I showed from a, from a sinus perspective, um, you know, generally speaking, at a year, patients are doing pretty okay. I'll tell you what, though, acromegalic patients um, and Cushing's patients, those are, um, unfortunately, those are pathologies that like to have nasal scarring. And so that's something that as an as a ear, nose, and throat surgery provider, in the first few months afterwards, I see those patients quite regularly to make sure that they're not having any scarring in their nose because, again, I just like I said before, I, ha I don't use the words never, ever because I have you know, ever seen patients scar in their nasal airway and they have, uh, they can't breathe through their nose. And so their sinus related quality of life, uh, generally if you're on top of it and you can avoid scarring, um, it does, does okay about a year out and, and thereafter. The trouble with acromegalic patients is that there can continue to be hormonal issues that cause endocrine abnormalities. And so those are the things like Dr. McCurgy was relating to. So fatigue, for instance, is something we worry about, energy levels, um, and, and things that, you know, if you're still dealing with, um, with um, whatever you're dealing with, whether it's a growth hormone related problem or a cortisol problem, a, a, a steroid related problem, problem that can put a lot of stress in your body and it can um, it can beat you up a little bit and so um, some patients do have quality of life issues um, long-standing however hopefully that after management of a tumor either with uh, surgery and or um, in, in some uh, uh, unoften but sometimes uh, radiation um, uh, in conjunction with one of those two things and medical management um, you know, your symptoms can be under control and you can have a, you know, a, a pretty darn good quality of life. And that's what we shoot for in our patients. Yeah. Work yeah. team to kind of manage it. Yeah, totally agree. And, you know, some of the, some of those, especially with acromegaly and Cushing's, people can have some sort of odd, odd symptoms. You know, some of the, um, with acromegaly, you can have some swelling in your joints and your hands and that can cause some tingling and, and cause carpal tunnel and those kinds of things. So, um, you know, oftentimes it is, especially a year out, quality of life may have more to do, more, more so to do with uh, medical management uh, and getting your, your, even if your numbers are okay, getting some of the residual side effects under, under control. So it is, it is tricky, but I think connecting with a multidisciplinary team with a lot of experience helps. Okay, I think that wraps it up for today. Thank you both so much. That was a really great presentation. We really appreciate you guys coming out tonight. Um, very informative. So thank you again. Our pleasure. That, our pleasure. Th thanks, thanks, thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you.
And that will conclude today's webinar presentation. We appreciate you all taking the time to join us. If you missed any part of this webinar, or if you would like to share it with family members or friends, it will be available on our website at www.pituitary.org after it is edited. There will be a brief survey after the webinar. Please feel free to fill it out and help us provide you with the information you need. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you both again. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much, Danielle. Appreciate it. Danielle. Raj, thank goodness they're editing it for you. Gosh. Thank, thank goodness for what now? Editing? Editing. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, yeah, so I, I tried. I tried. I'm not. I'm no, not you good. did great. <laughs> Absolutely yeah, great. Yeah thanks, yeah, thanks in advance for the editing. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Have okay, a great night. Have a good night. See you. See you. Bye bye.